it continues to be a huge priority for me. And really, it really is about me executing my purpose to create really fun and engaging environments for people where they feel the best that they can possibly be when they come to work and implementing different strategies and techniques in order to engage people and create fun and open kind of free environments where people can really connect to the reason why they're there and have fun while they're doing it. That was Taryn Evans, Workforce Planning Manager at Melbourne Olympic Parks. With a passion for sport and entertainment, Taryn has worked alongside some of Melbourne's most treasured events, including the Melbourne Cup and the Australian Open, just to name a few. I've been fortunate enough to work with Taryn for a number of years now, and she's an incredible operator with a lot to learn from when it comes to leadership and engaging and retaining your team. In this podcast, Taryn and I take a closer look at what it means to be a good leader and how through learned experience, both good and bad, leadership can be harnessed to ensure that you get the most out of you and also your team. As we explore the idea of the experience business, Taryn shares her insights into why it's so important to be open to new experiences and follow your gut when it comes to finding your passion. You never know what opportunities this may present. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Taryn Evans, so good to have you on the Engage Volunteer podcast. You've had an incredible journey to date. Thanks so much for joining us, mate. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Really appreciate being here. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Look, Taryn, I'm really interested to um, almost jump to the start of your journey in terms of workforce and volunteer management and, and how you got into it uh, at the very beginning, please. Yeah, I suppose understanding or connecting to wanting to, to work in this sort of space and, mm-hmm. and work with volunteers and casuals and on that kind of mass level didn't really come to me until probably later on in my career. Mm-hmm. Today. I started off in IT of all industries and just right. kind of worked in, in the people space, I suppose, in, in HR initially, started in payroll, funnily enough, um, and really just learned a lot and understood business broadly and was given some really awesome opportunities in a small business in my early 20s and then I realized that connecting to something that I was passionate about and had a real personal interest in being sport and entertainment essentially Mm -hmm. was something that I wanted to carve out my career in and really connect to that personal interest so I was lucky enough to get a role at the Victoria Racing Club in the Mm -hmm. HR team and essentially worked on a a couple of spring racing carnivals and the Melbourne Cup in planning. And it was quite learning and development and training focused, working both with our permanent team and casual workforce as well, uh, which was incredible, such a great experience. And then beyond that, I moved into a role at Foxtel in HR, which Mm -hmm. was a real reminder to me as much as I enjoyed my time there and learned a lot. It was a real reminder that that side of entertainment in in terms of broadcast production, that yes. sort of stuff wasn't the connection that I was looking for. And then I was actually approached for a role at Melbourne Olympic Parks, which is where yeah. I am now in HR. And then I've since moved into a workforce planning manager, essentially heading up our workforce of about 600 or so directly engaged staff and then also oversight of our contract workforce as well, yeah. which has been awesome. So the Australian Open being the, the pinnacle of, of the jewel in, in our crown, I suppose, in yeah. terms of the events that we work on. So yeah, the, it's just exciting every year. It's such a huge build up and, and this time of year off the back of COVID leading into Australian Open 2021, will it, won't it, what's happening? It's um, mm-hmm. the uncertainty, the speed, the pace, the decisions. It's just an exciting, exciting place to be. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, what an interesting year it's been for mm. everyone and for you guys leading into one of Australia's largest events uh, mm. for next year. So we'll get into that. Yeah. Absolutely. If we can look at that journey, I mean, what was it about the, the experience of Foxtel that you realised it wasn't for you? I think it was the commerciality of the business. The business purely is there to make money for shareholders, provide entertainment to punters of the Foxtel product and provide dividends to to the shareholders. The thing that was really missing for me was the dual purpose of the community, more people-based element, which is something that Melbourne Olympic Parks really stands for quite strongly being a government organisation. We really balance our priorities and our, I suppose, strategic kind of efforts with both 
providing parklands and community benefits to people of Victoria, as well as sustaining the buildings in our precinct to hold events for the people of Victoria and yeah. Australia and the world. So it's something that really struck with me that I needed that balance for me to keep yeah, me in like and really connect with, with what I was doing. I think that's a, it's a consistent thread that we've had through the podcast of, of a lot of workforce and volunteer managers mm. uh, wanting to make sure there's a purpose to the work they're doing and yeah. probably a connection to going, yeah, it's tough work and, and we'll get to the tough work, of course, <laughs> but at the end of the day, often resulting in smiles of people. A hundred percent. That's the business. <laughs> We're in the experience business, so <laughs> smiles is all it's about. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, and I've obviously worked alongside you for a long time now, Karen, and, and you've often, you've struck me as a, a really great leader that I can imagine you sort of putting your foot down about going, this needs to involve people and have a, a greater good in terms of the work we're doing compared to just doing the work for the sake of doing the work. Has that been something that you've always been very strong on? Because I see the impact it's had on on the business at Melbourne Olympic Parks and I've been involved with some of the events that you've run and, and always noticed, I guess, a lot of the smiling faces that people are sort of following you on, on this journey. I think you, you've done a great job in that. Has that been something you've learned or uh, you've always had that leadership strength? That's really kind. Thank you. I really <laughs> appreciate that. those comments. Yeah, look, I think early on, if I go right back to the beginning of the journey of Taryn Evans, yeah. in working environment, I used to work for Mitre 10. <laughs> that was my yeah, first nice. ever job. Good. Yeah, right back early days, I started working when I was basically as soon as I could legally could, 14 sure. and nine months at the time. I wonder if that's changed. <laughs> yeah, okay. Probably legal now, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it struck me really early on that in order to get the best out of people, you had to be having a good time. And it's not rocket science now that as, as you evolve yeah. and kind of get further into developing and learning in a workplace environment, but it was something that I had some pretty bad managers and I think I learned and it really struck me quite early on about what not to do and what yeah, didn't work sure. in the working environment. So from a leadership perspective, I suppose through school and everything, I kind of naturally had some leadership ability but that was where I could really connect it to the workplace about what was working what wasn't and then how could I use those learnings in my own capacity and it's been a huge and it continues to be a huge priority for me and really it really is about me executing my purpose to create really fun and engaging environments for people where they feel the best that they can possibly be when they come to work and implementing different strategies and techniques in order to engage people and create fun and open, free environments where people can really connect to the reason why they're there and have fun while they're doing it. Yeah, and I think another episode of the podcast is with Aidan Shaw. I'm not sure if you've you've met Aidan before, but a Victorian guy and he's just a lot of what he spoke about was different experiences that he gained when he was in university and coming out of university. And Little mm-hmm. did he know at the time he was that was all he was just gaining was that experience, both good and bad and random, mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. all leading to where he was ultimately getting to in the end. And it's it's funny because sometimes I think people are reserved about opening themselves up to having a bad experience, where ultimately you've probably learnt the most from sometimes those bad experiences. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's something you could talk about, just given your journey and maybe your learnings from that as well. Yeah, I think definitely in this in this role, leading and being accountable. So I started in at Melbourne Olympic Parks in a HR role, which predominantly is influencing. You're working with other leaders for them to lead their team, coach and guide and develop those leaders to give them the skills and the techniques to lead their team. And then it became really clear to me that I wanted to be the leader. I wanted to be accountable. So when the this workforce planning manager role came up, I really grabbed it. It was time and I was ready and I learnt very early on, particularly with the workforce that I was working with and continue to work with ongoing, I learned the hard way that engaging your supervisor or your leader group that are leading those on the ground mm-hmm. and on the front line is so critical. And it's critical to identify who the influencers are in that group, both good and bad. You've got some sometimes some really difficult people at all levels of your workforce yes. and you've got some others that are kind of early adopters or are probably more positive or easily able to, to jump on board with change yes. or improvement. So identifying who those people are early, 
I needed to make it my business to get them on board and kind of be their best friend right from day yeah. one. But I learned that the hard way. I made some I made some mistakes and it wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, all part of the journey, isn't it? Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of people are speaking to, uh, they start off thinking it's my way or the highway a little and mm. I'm a little less receptive to feedback. But I guess as your career goes on, it's almost that, it's about getting out of the way almost and letting mm-hmm. the workforce sort of create its own journey and its own feeling and its own community in a way without Taryn Evans needing to be involved in every single facet of it. Have you had any thoughts about that in terms of letting it run and letting it create its own own machine? Yeah, I, actually, that is a really, well, it's not unique, I suppose. It, it is just a really strong characteristic of the workforce that I'm working with at the moment is that sense of community. and. Sure identifying that this group of people and through COVID it's been a huge priority for us understanding that this characteristic of this workforce that the social connection and the community element to this group of people is so strong whilst this group have been out of work for seven eight months all they really want is to stay socially connected so one thing that we've done is on a really regular basis, on probably a monthly basis, we've just run trivia nights where we've just opened it up and said, jump on Zoom. We're just going to get some FaceTime with each other, have some laughs, bring a glass of wine, and we'll run some trivia. And that's been a huge connection point for people and really kept people engaged with our business and each other through the last few months. So that's been a a good example of that, I think. Uh, Well, I think that's the, that's the thing that sometimes people can forget is about the, you're obviously needing volunteers to fill shifts and and Mm. workforce to fill shifts, but Mm. you're also offering them something back in return. Exactly. It isn't, isn't always just about cash in hand for them. It's about Mm. feeling connected and you've probably had a lot of staff there that have been there for a long time, that a very strong part of that community, longer than you've been there really. Absolutely. yeah. Longer than I will ever be there. Some people, you know, 20, 25, 30, 35 years. And we've got a, a bit of an ongoing little joke in our team. We call it love at first shift. And we, we've got lots of stories where people have met their partners, married, they've had kids, they've grown up at Mount Olympic Parks, which is so beautiful. But sometimes that longevity can kind of pose a bit of a challenge, certainly from a change perspective. But at the same time, yeah. it's just so... It's just so heartwarming that people grow up in, yeah. in these sorts of places. And I had the same experience at the VRC as well but with those that are so connected to that event of the Melbourne Cup or the Spring Racing Carnival. And they would come back year after year after year and really connect and are just so passionate about that every year. Yeah. It's lovely. Is there a, is there a secret source for that, do you think, in terms of retention and engagement with your volunteers and your workforce? Like clearly you've, You've been in this game a little while now and you've seen some great programs. Is there a consistent learning that you've had there about engagement that leads to retention? Um, I think, well, I think it's about connecting them to the product and connecting them to why they're there, connecting them to, and ourselves, to something that's bigger than us. And the Australian Open or the Melbourne Cup is global and huge and prominent and people love to sit at a barbecue, maybe not now, because yeah. <laughs> but previous and talk to their friends about something that they or their family that's something that they are connected to something like that so the more opportunity you get to make that a reality so implementing initiatives like with when I was at the VRC it was the 150th running of the Melbourne Cup and we wanted to recognize people's contribution to that particular event because it was such a milestone So we organised for every member of our workforce to have an opportunity to have like a professional photo with the actual Melbourne Cup. So we set this whole big studio up in at the top of the main grandstand and they booked in a time and they got to come in and have a photo and it was their special moment that they could connect with and something that's tangible related to the event as opposed to just working at it. It was, yeah, that memento that they could take yeah, definitely, Beyond. for sure, yeah. and hold on to forever. Yeah. Now, last year, we were lucky enough to be invited along to the awards ceremony that you you uh, have put together there for the workforce and I guess the entire organisation, really recognising the hours put in by, by your workforce. Talk me through 
that event and how it's evolved because it was certainly quite a show last year <laughs> and one thing I think a lot of people can learn from, whether they have the budgets or not, mm. um, from what you obviously are lucky enough to have there, Melbourne mm. Olympic Parks, but in terms of the idea and the concept, I think it's a brilliant mm. one to show and, and engage with people. Yeah, it, you're right. It, it certainly has evolved into a full-scale production in Rod Laver Arena. So we're so fortunate and so lucky to have – we put on these incredible shows for others and we work behind the scenes tirelessly, hours, blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice from our families. And it's not just the directly engaged Melbourne Olympic Park team, it's broadly it's our all of our business partners, every single person that plays a role in bringing that precinct to life. It was probably about six years ago, we were running an event which we were calling our end of year update. So it was kind of like our big kind of end of year town hall, but it was kind of, you know, small fry, come along, have a um, sausage roll and, yeah. <laughs> and a glass yeah. of beer and we'll tell you some cool things that happen throughout the year and, and give everyone a pat on the back. But through lots of influence and support, we were able to, I suppose, position it into something more recognition-based and it's really evolved over time. And our executive leadership team and our board have really got behind this event. It's called For You Live and it includes a guest list of probably five, upwards of 500 people every year and we hold it in one of our venues. We like to kind of shuffle it around and kind of t- use it as a bit of a test about different modes of operating or maybe some different infrastructure that we might have invested in throughout the year. And we invite all of our people, as I said, our casuals, our permanent team, our business partners to come along and really just celebrate them. It's called yep. For You Live for a reason. And just just really put them on the pedestal and thank them for all of their efforts. And we hand out, we go through a, a nomination process where we gather stories throughout the year of outstanding effort and present some awards and just have a bit of a party. Yeah. <laughs> right. A question that sort of stemmed off that, Sometimes workforce and volunteer programs struggle to get the recognition from the wider business, uh, thinking that it's just something that happens. Uh, Mm. I'm sure you've sort of faced this across your journey a little. I know that you've really championed the workforce team that's there and and you're a driving Mm. force behind these awards and things like this to make sure people Mm. are recognised. I don't know if you, you've faced that or any advice for people listening about trying to really bring their volunteer program up or their workforce program up, make sure the whole organisation recognises the impact that this team has on, on mm. ultimately the product that you're trying to deliver. Yeah, well, I suppose as I said um, at the beginning, we're in the experience business and so the frontline experience is delivered by these volunteers or casual employees. Yeah. So the connection and the role that they play is so critical. So the more that you can demonstrate that point, measure it, use tangible measures and measures of success and numbers on a page, whether you're measuring your NPS score or the engagement of your actual workforce or whatever measures you're using, that's a great place to start because you can't argue with the numbers. Sure, Um, sure. Essentially, that's where I started, particularly with Melbourne Olympic Parks, is really understanding the the engagement and the alignment results and and where our organization where that workforce was sitting from alignment meaning how connected are they to what we do as a business and and our strategies i suppose we had pretty low alignment and engagement scores and so connecting the improvement of that in the improvement of your guest experience or your patron experience and proposing and putting in place tactics in order to get there, it takes a long time. It takes a long time yeah. to, yeah. to prioritise funds and resources and money. The minute you get just one little win, you get a bit of momentum, you're halfway there. Yeah, uh, Taryn, that's, that's awesome. Um, it's a really good insight because I think – Sometimes people can bang their hands on the table and say, why aren't you thinking about us or why aren't we getting the recognition? But at the end of the day, nothing speaks louder than numbers and and data that, like you said, uh, now that can be a big transition from people from going from, but look at the results to numbers. Mm. Uh, uh, Was that just something that you realized you needed to do or or was that direction from the higher up saying, look, you're going to need to convince me this is what I'm going to need to see? Oh, I think it's probably a bit of a combination of both and particularly yeah. le- also learning the hard way. Like I've banged my head, my hands oh, on the course. table before many times. Yeah. And why can't you just see? <laughs> um, but I've had some great 
great leaders over the journey as well that have come from different backgrounds outside of events, maybe more corporate or kind of um, FMCG type businesses that are driven by numbers. These commercial businesses are just driven by the numbers. Don't talk to me unless you're going to shift this this dial totally. somewhere. Totally. Um, and that was really drilled into me and, and worked. As soon as it starts working, you're like, okay, this is working. So let's continue on this journey and, and keep demonstrating the benefit through the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think in particular for volunteer programs, it's very black and white about the, the hours that these volunteers mm. are putting in. That is mm. a commercial saving, let's face it, mm-hmm. for the organisations that had they not yeah. had them, that's, that's paid workforce and a direct cost. But Correct, sometimes yeah. I think people uh, forget about that a little or, or find mm. it a little too difficult to make that tangible. But I think it's um, something that it should be factored um, mm. for any workforce program to really show the benefit of what the work you're doing. Um, yeah, really good. So, Tara, a couple of quick questions for you. So, obviously, working in workforce can, can have its challenges. I mean, I've seen you and the team, you know, at the, the end of the Australian Open, pretty knackered, <laughs> pretty tired after a long, long few weeks, you know, yeah. not being home much, missing family, so on. Why do you keep doing the work you're doing? What is it that keeps you coming back for more? Oh, great question. I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm crazy. Um, no, it's really a really obvious, clear example of me living my purpose is being able to curate and design this workplace experience on a mass level. It just really floats my boat. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And <laughs> so it should. And then I guess for you, a two-part question really about success. So firstly, what does success look like for you personally? So, and I mean that almost down to the granular level about going home Mm. at the end of the day, um, satisfied in in what you're doing. Mm. What does success mean to you? I think it's achieving what you, well, for me, it's about achieving what I set out to achieve. So whether it is shifting the numbers and over time, seeing that improvement in whatever I set out to, from an engagement perspective and and really using those measures to determine what I believe success to be on a longer term, longer term scale. And on a, I suppose on a, at a granular level, on a daily basis, it's nothing went wrong. Everything went to plan, which Mm -hmm. we know in the event environment doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's beautiful. And how, um, we kind of touched on this a little bit. How do you deal with that failure if 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 and when that happens i mean it sometimes is out of your control completely but Mm. how's your evolution been in terms of dealing with (laughs) failure in the work that you do yeah actually a bit of an evolution yeah yeah very very good words um early days um i really struggled with perfectionism and nothing was ever good enough and again had some great leaders in the past that have given me that feedback particularly around from a leadership perspective and understanding the impact of that on others and where you create this this environment of perfectionism nobody feels good because sure. perfect sure. doesn't exist and they're striving for something that actually isn't real mm. so i forgot your question but um, <laughs> how, how, what's the evolution of dealing with failure so uh, yeah, yeah. You, you've kind of hit the nail on the head there. at the start mm. of your career, probably just wanting everything to be perfect and, mm. and beating yourself up and questioning mm. others perhaps around the way that they are acting too if they're not hitting your high levels of mm. expectation too. Where, where are you at now with it? Well, I suppose we kind of touched on it before. It's It's really striking that balance between understanding and appreciating that you are in or I'm in a yeah. in a position of failure or something hasn't worked the way that I wanted it to at the moment, but I know that this is going to be a learning experience. Sure. It bruises the ego. It feels crap. But <laughs> longer term, I know I'm going to learn from it because I've learned from them in the past. And yeah. it's actually where I've learned the most. So yeah. it's really just understanding and putting in perspective that silver lining, I suppose. It's, it's crap right now, but I know long term, I'm going to learn so much more from this. Yeah, big time. And and. The work you guys do in terms of the amount of people and random scenarios and weather and whatnot, like <laughs> there's so much room for learnings in what you're doing. So I'm sure no doubt the last four or five years you've been uh, in Melbourne Olympic Park, you, you've learned a lot through that. So uh, the next one is the working with mass workforce and volunteers is provide some random, fun, sad, crazy moments. Uh, mm-hmm. is, there a, is there a moment that really sticks out to you in, in your career? Not one in particular. I was reflecting yep. on this before we before we jumped on the call. And I think what really 
it gives me the warm and fuzzies is seeing people achieve their own career goals through the work at events and starting off as a volunteer or as a casual employee and seeing their career grow and not just necessarily you know from a role or a hierarchical perspective but skill development and growth as a person and I have been lucky enough to work with a number of those people three of them are in my team at the moment in the workforce team and they're just They've just got something really special about them, this this level of humility and understanding that if you don't come from that side of things in terms of being boots on the ground, front line, there's a level of understanding that you bring with you that not everybody has. And it, we've got one of our operations manager, operations manager for Margaret Cornerina, similar. He started in operations as a casual and the depth of knowledge and the talent and skill that he brings to that role now over the years as he's developed is just amazing. So there's not one in particular, but there's people that I can, that I look at and I'm like, you're really special. You're really special yep. and I love the fact that I've been able to work with you. Yeah, so good. And I think that that journey provides perspective on how others feel and react mm. in different personalities that you can Perhaps early in your career, you could you could strike out mm. and be mm. like, oh, I don't know about this one. Or, yeah. or maybe later in your career, realizing, hang on, this person's got a real skill here. We're not going to put them over here because that's not going to suit. But yeah. hey, they're going to really excel in these areas. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, look, Tan, that's, um, that's probably a wrap. I, I really enjoyed that. I think, you're, as I said, you're someone that we all look up to in this workforce world in terms of treating people with respect and, and creating a program that doesn't necessarily need Taryn Evans in the middle of it, but the team understand that what's required and to execute at that higher level. And, and I, some great insight there in terms of the numbers to, to really justify your program mm. and, and sort of grow the program. And then that flows into the engagement, like the, the awards and the events that you hold. So, um, yeah, um, exciting times to come for you, no doubt, Darren. And thanks for joining us on, on the podcast. Thank you. You are so kind. Thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. No worries. All good. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Engage Volunteer Podcast with Taryn Evans. We hope you enjoyed it. If this is your first time listening, then welcome. Our podcast aims to highlight the ways in which organizations and individuals are engaging their communities to connect them to events and causes they're passionate about with new episodes released each Wednesday fortnight. The best way to support the podcast is to click follow on your Spotify app or wherever you listen today. And of course, tell your friends about us. On our next episode, we are joined by the incredibly experienced Bron Parry, Manager of Projects, Planning and Systems at Commonwealth Games Australia. A lover of sports in general, Bron has spent her career working at many of Australia's largest sporting bodies and always strives to ensure that like any good coach, her volunteers feel valued and part of the team. In this podcast, we take a closer look at Bron's career journey, its highs and lows, and the important role that volunteers play within a sporting federation all the way down to the club community. We also discuss the impacts COVID-19 has had on the workforce that surrounds and supports sports in Australia. As the operator of a contracting business herself, Bron talks about the importance of staying positive during these challenging times and how now more than ever, we need to be flexible and open to new opportunities. We hope to catch you then.